constituents around the country that need the help from medical prescribed cannabis. Can I ask the Secretary of State if he will make a statement on the return of medical cannabis that was seized from Emma Appleby at South End Airport on Saturday the 6th of April, which is needed to treat a very ill daughter, Tegan, extreme epilepsy, her extreme epilepsy, and make steps to make sure this is available for his prescription around this great country. State Secretary Matt Hancock. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, my sympathies go out to the patients and to their families who are desperately seeking to alleviate their symptoms with medicinal cannabis. Mr Speaker, we're working hard to get the right approach. The law was changed on the 1st of November last year to ensure that it is now legal for doctors on the specialist register of the GMC to prescribe cannabis-based products for medicinal use in the UK. Whether to prescribe must remain a clinical decision to be made with the patients and their families, taking into account the best available international clinical evidence and the circumstances of each individual patient. Indeed, there, have already, there are already prescriptions that have been written for the products that the family attempted to bring into the country, and these have been supplied to patients. Without clinical authorisation, it is of course not possible to import controlled drugs, which is why the products were seized by the Border Force on Saturday. However, we have made available the opportunity for a second opinion, and the products have been held but not been destroyed, as would normally be the case. In relation to childhood epilepsy, the British Paediatric Neuro Neurology Association has issued interim clinical guidance. NHS England and the Chief Medical Officer have made it clear that cannabis-based products can be prescribed for medicinal use in appropriate cases, but it must be for doctors to make clinical decisions in the best interests of patients, to balance the risks and benefits of any proposed treatment, including cannabis-based products, and to make a decision with patients and with their families on whether or not to prescribe. To date, Research has centred on two major cannabinoids, THC and CBD. There is evidence that CBD may be beneficial in the treatment of intractable epilepsy, and over 80 children have already been supplied with CBD products in the UK on the basis of a specialist doctor's prescription. Now, I entirely understand how important this issue is to patients, and I've met and listened to families. I know just how frustrated they are. And therefore, after meeting parents, I've taken the following actions. First, I've asked NHS England rapidly to initiate a process evaluation to address barriers to clinically appropriate prescribing. Second, to improve the evidence base and to get medicinal cannabis to patients in need, I've asked the National Institute of Health Research and the industry to take action to produce that evidence in a form that will support decisions about public funding. NIHR has issued two calls for research proposals on medicinal cannabis, and I look forward to responses to those consultations. This is in addition to the training package being developed by Health Education England to, support every, uh, to provide support to clinicians to enable them to make the best decisions with their patients. Mr Speaker, this is a very difficult area with some heart-rending cases. I look forward to working with all members of this House to ensure patients get the best possible care. Sir Mike Penning. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Speaker. And can I say to the Secretary of State a thank you for coming and meeting the families and the loved ones of those that feel that medical cannabis on prescription may help their loved ones. Some of these young children, and we're not all talking about children, but some of these young children have 300 seizures a day. They're given drugs which actually don't seem to work at all. And there's not a cure, but these medical oils can and often do reduce the seizures. Many colleagues in the House will know of the case of Alfie Dingley, the only young boy that's got an NHS prescription for medical use of cannabis oil. He is now a relatively naughty boy. He's learned to ride a bike. His sister has a brother that she's never really experienced before. Now, it's not a cure, but these parents are absolutely desperate. They thought when the government did the right thing and changed the law that things were going to get better. Now, but I did warn them 
that actually this was the start of the journey as the chair of the all parliamentary joint chair of the all parliamentary group it would be a long journey uh, anybody that saw the footage from south end airport at the weekend as a parent as a father as anybody that has a loved one in their family that suffers would understand what the family were trying to do they've been prescribed it by a consultant abroad because we couldn't get it here. We are relying on charity in many cases so that the money can be raised, sometimes £1,500 a month, to actually get medical cannabis on prescription for people. As the Secretary of State knows, prescriptions are being issued by the relevant experts and the CCGs and the trusts are refusing to honour those prescriptions. Secretary of State, that is a disgrace in this country and we should all be ashamed of that. I welcome the trials and I welcome the review, but sadly these people need these medicines now. And can we unlock the door? The, the people at South End Airport at Boulder Force were very polite and very helpful. They thought they were doing their duty. We should do our duty and get that medical cannabis back to treatment. Uh, Mr Speaker, I pay tribute to the uh, right honourable member and the work that the APPG has done uh, to bring this issue to the attention of the House, to bring it to the attention of the country and to support those parents involved. And um, My right honourable friend has been uh, characteristically um, emphatic uh, and reasonable in how he's uh, trying to support these parents and I entirely understand the concerns. It was really emotional to meet some of the parents uh, as part of the APPG delegation. Now in the, in the, in the case, to answer his question specifically, uh, when it comes to the border force they of course were doing uh, the right thing and I'm glad that they were doing it in a, in a reasonable way. The right thing by the existing rules which is that for a controlled drug to be imported it needs a licence and for an unlicensed controlled drug, it therefore needs a prescription by a specialist doctor. There are 95,000, just over 95,000 registered specialist doctors in the UK, and any one of those who has the relevant experience in this area can prescribe this drug, and then it will be allowed in, uh, and that can happen now. The guidance is no barrier to that, and I want to make clear again that the guidance is not a barrier to prescription. But I am also clear that this isn't working. Hence, I have put in place the process evaluation, which is what the NHS, lang it's NHS language uh, for looking at exactly why this isn't working and what we need to do about it. Diane Abbott. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It really is shameful that we saw the scenes at South End Airport that we saw and that families continue to suffer because the arrangements around these issues are so slow. But let me just say that it is appropriate that we're discussing this question on the day that the new member for Newport West takes her seat because her predecessor, my friend Paul Flynn, was an indefatigable campaigner yeah. for many important causes, including the legalisation of cannabis for medical use. Last year, Charlotte Caldwell, the mother of another sick child, Billy Caldwell, said about the Home Secretary. It is absolutely incredible. He is amazing. The compassion and speed that the Home Secretary has moved with is just incredible. That is the impression that ministers sought to give, but it was a misleading impression, as the plight of the Applebee's this weekend reveals. Is the minister aware that cannabis oil is not the same as cannabis? It has no psychoactive or addictive effects? Is the minister aware that in other jurisdictions a whole range of conditions are qualified for treatment by cannabis oil and related products, including cancer, AIDS, muscular dystrophy, Crohn's disease, epilepsy, Parkinson's disease and arthritis? And is the minister aware that the Home Secretary previously commissioned Sally Davis to examine the scheduling of cannabis as a whole. And she reported as long ago as June 2018. Is the Minister aware that Ms Davis's report has been with the Advisory Committee on the Misuse of Drugs since that time? Is the House to understand that the Home Secretary has just been sitting on that report? What is the Minister 
the Secretary of State, I should say, going to do to speed up the processes around this issue? Parents will not be impressed to hear of further reports or further inquiries. We need to resolve the Appleby case quickly, but we also need to make sure that no other families of sick children have to suffer in the way the Appleby family is suffering. Um, Well, thank you very much, Mr Speaker. I did set out the answers to those questions in my initial um, response. There are two major active agents in uh, medicinal cannabis. There are a number of other small ones, but there are two major, THC and CBD. And the, the, the 80 or so Uh, the vast majority of those who now have access to medicinal cannabis have access to CBD, and that is different uh, as an active agent. The clinicians have to be to make the judgment according to the personal circumstances and needs of the patient. And what I am trying to do is remove all the barriers to those clinical decisions. So we have taken action. Absolutely, I understand the history here, because both the Home Secretary and I signed off on the decision to allow medicinal cannabis to be available at all on the 1st of December following the Chief Medical Officer's uh, report. What we need to do now is ensure that there are no further barriers to the to prescription where a clinician judges that that is the right thing to do. James Cartledge. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I am going be aware of the case of Indy Rose Clary, my constituent, who is a four-year-old girl, suffers from Javits syndrome, a very severe form of epilepsy, and her parents, Anthony and Tanine, they are also crowdfunding on the internet to raise thousands of pounds to buy drugs from Holland, not because they are criminals, Mr. Speaker, but because they love her and they want to ease her pain and they are desperate. And I put it to him on Friday, it so happens, I met with um, Indy Rose, not only her consultant, but one of the leading specialists in the country in um, specialist form, uh, in severe forms of child epilepsy. And he made the point that there is a barrier to prescribing for cannabinoids that include THC because there is insufficient evidence uh, in that case. Can he confirm that there is evidence on CBDs but not with THC, which is, as far as Indy Rose is concerned, where her parents have found the greatest impact on reducing seizures? Well, my honourable friend characteristically uh, makes an excellent point. The clinicians consider that there is a much lower amount of evidence on um, the question of THC uh, as opposed to C. Uh, BD. Um, um, therefore, I've instructed the National Institute of Health Research to do the research. And doing the research will, of course, require some cases where the, where the um, uh, drugs can be legally tested. And I'm putting that in place. Uh, I've already, I'd already put that in place, and I'm telling the House about it today. And Dr. Philippa Whitford. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'm glad to see that this urgent question has moved from the Home Office to Health, where it should be. But one does have to ask why drugs are being seized when this is no longer illegal drugs. That's what changed in November. In medicine, we use many controlled drugs. We use heroin, we use morphine, we use ketamine, we use diazepam that have a street value, but it has never stopped them being used in medicine. The problem is the way cannabis was treated for 50 years means we have had almost no research and almost no experience. Here, here. And the problem is expectations were raised in November as if every GP would be able to simply write a prescription. But a prescription for what? It has to be a pharmaceutical quality of, of drug so that you know exactly how much CBD, how much THC you'd be prescribing. That is not yet generally available. And I think it is important that we are looking through the government to get pharmaceutical grade licensed with reliable formulations. This is under inquiry in the Health Select Committee, and we have heard from patients who were advised to go to Holland to get drugs, costing them £30,000 per visit, and that's unacceptable. The government will have to stimulate, and I'm grateful that calls for research are going to go out, but we need specialist centres in paediatric neurology for the children with epilepsy, we need adult neurology for multiple sclerosis, and we need pain specialists for chronic pain. Because these preparations are unlicensed, that means there's been no testing 
on their efficacy, meaning whether they work, and on whether they're safe. And that's something that is quite scary for doctors, particularly as if it's an unlicensed drug, they have to sign on the form to say they accept personal liability. And that is quite an intimidating thing, I can tell you as I've done it. The government, therefore, does need to push for centres of excellence to help stimulate the research they say they're calling for, because this is the only way we will get randomised controlled trials and actually get answers to lead to these being licensed, not just a temporary fix for now. Yeah. Um, well, in an outbreak of uh, cross-party unity, I agree entirely with the Honourable Lady. Uh, the approach that she's taken is um, I incredibly sensible and is the one that is recommended to me by my clinical advisers also, to make sure that we can get a, an evidence-based pharmaceutical uh, grade a, a approach to, this, to prescription. Uh, I'll take away her idea of centres of excellence. I entirely see the point there, because in the case of most drugs, it's the pharmaceutical industry that pushes for and pays for the randomised control trials. In, the case, in, the, in this case, because the industry is in, a, is in a different shape for other reasons, it's us who are making this happen, uh, and uh, we're pushing this as fast as we can. Mr. Richard Harrington. I'd like to uh, thank my right honourable friend from Hemel Hempstead for bringing this question forward and to the Secretary of State for his answer. My, my constituents, the Levies, came to see me about their daughter, Fallon, who has LGS epilepsy, and her consultant neurologist has told the family that, the, I quote, the actual logistics of the prescri prescribing has not yet been worked out. Why is this the case, and what can be done to ensure that Fallon has access to the necessary medication as soon as possible? Well, uh, if he'll write to me with the exact case, because um, that, the, um, uh, the process for a prescription by a, somebody on the specialist register um, is well trodden and is used in, in all sorts of different unlicensed um, drugs and, um, and should be available. And we're making a second opinion available uh, to ensure that in, in his case, then a second opinion, opinion can be brought to bear. So I, I'm very interested, and indeed this goes to everybody, I'm interested in the specific cases so we can ensure that the appropriate cl clinical decisions can be made. There was I thinking the Secretary of State would be the first to congratulate the Honourable Gentleman Member for Watford on his prodigious efforts and output as a Minister. But I feel sure that, that will come ere long. Dr Sarah Wollaston. I really welcome the measures announced by the Secretary of State today and to just ask him to go further in, in discussing the importance of clinical trials to answer some of the many questions including about the right balance between THC and CBD. Um, what we heard at the Select Committee is that there are some pharmaceutical companies that are refusing to supply their products to make them available for clinical trials. Would he also look specifically at that point? Because we do need to make sure that, that there are safe and consistent products available um, of regular and predictable pharmaceutical grade, as we've just heard earlier. Um, yes, well, uh, if I may, Mr. Speaker, I would like to um, add to my previous answer. Uh, my congratulations to the, um, uh, the former business minister on all that he did to support business enterprise and the case for capitalism uh, whilst in his um, former job. And it, uh, I regret um, his departing the government because he was a brilliant minister. Um, on, the, um, on, on the question ahead of me, so to speak, um, the, um, the Honourable Lady, the Chair of the Select Committee, is quite right uh, that it is vital... Uh, to, to bring forward uh, these uh, clinical trials and that the pharmaceutical companies that provide these oils have not pushed forward those, tri those trials in a way that would normally happen and therefore we have stepped in in order to try to make, to make that happen. But we do need these calls to be answered. Ben Bradshaw. Yeah, yeah. The, he talks about removing barriers, but it's clear to me, Mr Speaker, that the main barrier that needs removing is the barrier of the British Paediatric Neurological Absolutely. Association itself. Absolutely. When its president came to give evidence to our committee a couple of weeks ago, he was arrogant, he was dismissive of the yeah. family's experience, he misled our committee by denying that members of this House had sought a dialogue with him and that he had refused. What's he going to do to remove the obstacle of the BPNA? Absolutely. 
Well, I'm sure that the BPNA will have listened to that testimony by, uh, uh, by the Honourable Gentleman. Um, of course, the BPNA is independent of government, and we have to follow um, the clinical judgments that are made by the uh, relevant organisation, whether it's the Royal College or, in this case, an association. What I've ensured uh, is that a second opinion is available, because the BPNA guidance is merely guidance. It is not absolute, and a clinician on the special, a specialist register can make a decision, whichever they, decision they think is fit, uh, according to the patient in front of them. Rachel McLean. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Can the Secretary of State give some more details of the timeline for the review that he's talked about, which are very welcome, but I'm sure that we all sympathise with parents like Mrs Appleby, who's just doing absolutely everything she can for her daughter. Um, yes, the call for, um, the, the call for um, randomised control trials um, is, um, a and also the process evaluation are both being conducted very urgently by NHS England. Lee Cowan. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. There's lots of warm words circulating here today, and it really goes to the last point they have made. We've got this problem here today and tomorrow. Clinical trials will take six months, nine months, a year. What can we reasonably do to legally get products we know are certified and work into the hands of parents today who have got children who desperately need them? I uh, entirely understand and um, feel, um, feel the same way as the Honourable Member does about the urgency of these cases um, and the, the need to get a second opinion now can be actioned immediately and will be actioned immediately because the crucial thing is that a, we cannot prescribe unlicensed medicines without any clinicians making that prescription. There are just over 95,000 clinicians on the uh, specialist register. Any of those who have expertise in this area can, if their clinical judgment allows them to, can make these prescriptions. And that can happen right now. Mr Lawton. Uh, Mr Speaker, I was very supportive of the case of Alfie Dingley and the change in the law, and the Secretary State is absolutely right that this must be based on clinical decisions. But given that there are several hundred children suffering from severe intractable epilepsy, isn't it the problem that the, uh, the guidance from the NHS and medical bodies is just too uh, stringent? And is it true that only two NHS prescriptions have actually been issued to date? And given that the case here, Tegan Appleby, she's had at least a dozen uh, prescribed drugs, which I won't list to avoid stressing Hansard, as well as having a nerve stimulator. What is the downside of allowing her access to this medical cannabis now? Well, he, he, makes, he makes a very good point. Now, of course, um, there, are, there are over 80 prescriptions that have been made, but that is both THC and CBD. Um, of course, THC also brings with it risks. Um, the, the active elements of um, uh, it, within cannabis uh, do bring risks. There are also benefits, and I've seen those benefits very clearly, and it must be for a clinician to decide the balance of those risks. Now, I have enormous sympathy with the families. I've heard their personal testimony of the massive benefit of their children, who sometimes, as my right honourable friend said, have 300 seizures a day. I've seen that, and I have looked them in the eye, and I understand the benefit that it brings. And, but it has to be a clinician who makes that judgment. I am not medically qualified, and I can't overrule clinicians, but there are clinicians available um, who can provide a second opinion, and that's what I can do. Thank you, Debonair. <laughs> Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, I've, uh, um, <laughs> The dangers of internet memes. Um, I am grateful to the Secretary of State for what he said so far, but I've spoken with a neurosurgeon in my constituency who says that one of his anxieties is not being able to give good advice to parents who he suspects may or may not be trying to get access to medical cannabis not wholly through a legal route, and not being able to advise them because he's not sure of what the law is. And I understand what he says about the need for clinical evidence, and I agree. So what more information can he tell us about the time scale? The uh, health education research that he talks about, when will we see this? What will be the time frame? And in the meantime, why can we not use the evidence of clinical trials conducted elsewhere? Yeah, yeah. 
evidence, the evidence of clinical trials elsewhere absolutely can and should be used. All international clinical evidence should be uh, brought to bear on these decisions, um, and has been in the case of um, CBD. Um, and um, on the answer to how quickly, as she pr can probably imagine, the answer is as soon as possible. Michael Fabricant. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Scottish SNP spokesman was absolutely spot on. It's not just ketamine and diazepam, but other drugs, other drugs like beta blockers, which are extremely dangerous in the wrong hands. So can my right honourable friend perhaps speak to the Home Secretary and say that, look, this is a medical treatment. It shouldn't be a controlled drug as such, and it shouldn't be stopped at our borders, particularly as it seems not enough people are prepared to prescribe for it now. Um, well, I, I, did, I have, of course, spoken to the um, Home Secretary uh, this morning about this issue. Um, and um, it, when we propose to take this as a health matter, not as a borders matter, because the border force were merely um, following the rules, and the question is whether the drug is licensed, and if it's not licensed but is controlled, whether it has uh, clinical sign-off. The truth is that, that these compounds do also have uh, negative effects, um, and so it does have to be a controlled drug. Uh, I don't support the legalisation of all cannabis. Unless you support the legalisation of cannabis in all cases, um, then it does have to be a controlled drug, and that leads us to the situation that we're in, where what we need to do is get the evidence of the, of the medical and clinical benefit which the families emphatically um, explain, um, and um, I would like to see properly, properly dealt with. Mr Speaker, some reports suggest that even Alfie Dingley himself, whose case gave rise to this new legislation, probably wouldn't be eligible for medicinal cannabis under these new regulations because they are just so strict. So when he says 95,000 clinicians are kind of ready and waiting to sign off these uh, prescriptions, can he explain why they're not doing it? If it's as easy as that, surely they would be doing it. What else is he going to do to look at those barriers? We, we've ensured that all of the um, patients who... Uh, got access on an exceptional basis before the law change on the 1st of November can continue to um, access uh, medicinal cannabis. And if that isn't the case in any instance, I want to know about it so we can fix that. Alfie Dingby would be eligible for these drugs if a clinician was um, prepared to sign off on its benefits for him. This has to be a, a decisions that are led by clinicians. And so I'm doing everything I can to get the evidence in place, to put second opinions in place, and to make sure that the process works as well as possible. That's what I can do. What I cannot do, what I cannot do, and it would be unreasonable for any health secretary to do, is to overrule clinical decision making in individual specific cases. That would be wrong, and I don't think any member of this House would propose that I do it. Chris Eaton Harris. Mr. Speaker, um, a number of us have been written to by constituents uh, about uh, these sorts of cases. Mine, uh, Julian Stuart Young, are parents of Lloyd, who I have corresponded with the Secretary of State about in the past. It strikes me, considering the, uh, the point around c clinical trials that has been raised across the House, that there is a piece of legislation that we have in place already. My old private member's bill of three years ago on the database for medical innovation sponsored by me here and Lord Saatchi in the other place um, seems ideally qualified to help us through this uh, sticky situation. Yes, we're looking at that um, uh, legislation very carefully and how we can put, into place, put it into place as effectively as possible, because understanding the, um, uh, the medical consequences through the, um, from, of any use of a, a drug um, is, is an incredibly helpful evidence for where it should be prescribed further, and that's uh, exactly the thrust of the drug that, uh, that, that the, the bill that he took through. He was a very good minister too. Another ex-minister to compliment. <laughs> I'm a bit surprised by the Secretary of State. He's slipping in his usual standard. I thought that he was going to be busily cultivating his honourable friend. That's what I was expecting. Tonia Antoniazzi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I'd like to congratulate uh, the honourable member, the co-chair for my, the APPG on medicinal cannabis with myself. I, this situation is, frankly, intolerable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have 
spoken with all of the families that have been requesting the medicinal cannabis with THC. Let's not forget the THC, because this situation cannot... I am sure that for Tegan there will be a second opinion and Tegan will be another child that will be able to have access to the medical cannabis. But what about all of the others? They cannot wait. And my right honourable friend from Exeter spoke very truthfully about the inquiry and the evidence that they've been taking and the BPNA have not not spoken in the way that they should That's have right. and not That's spoken right. well lied. enough to support these families. I won't say that word but I totally agree with what he is saying from a sedentary position. But please Secretary of State, this has got to stop. We cannot wait for clinical trials. There is medicine out there Get it to the children that need it. The, the, uh, the BPNA are going to have to answer for themselves for the way they conducted themselves in front of the Select Committee. They are independent uh, and, un- uh, and understandably in medicine, uh, the, dis- the bodies that take, make clinical guidance um, don't directly answer for that clinical guidance to the Secretary of State. But I understand her strength of feeling and the strength of feeling of others on this issue. I also understand the strength of feeling of the parents. I I, 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 I understand what a desperate situation they're in, and I'm trying to make sure that that can be resolved and they can get the drugs that they want to see. I just, pick, I just make one point um, to the Honourable Lady, which is the very exercise of doing a clinical trial needs, requires that we then get the drugs to some children. And I very much hope, therefore, that this, it's the start of a clinical trial that can help to get the drugs to people who need them. Rather, we don't have to wait for the results. Uh, Vicky Ford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Whilst medicinal cannabis can have great benefits for some epileptic children, we shouldn't forget the devastating impact that cannabis itself can have on the, and the long-term impact on psychosis and schizophrenia. And I speak from personal experience of living with a family member with those causes. So it is right that this is dealt with on a case by case basis, how soon will updated training be available for our health professionals? The, the updated training will be available imminently. Uh, the, the, there are health, there are risks as well as upsides. And it is absolutely right that it is clinicians that make the, di- the, the judgment in, the, in respect to every decision based on an individual patient. And that, that, I'm afraid, is the way that medicine has always, and I imagine always will be practised in this country. Davy. State confirm that it's true that if a Dutch mother had brought the same medicine to the United Kingdom, she could administer it to her own Dutch child without the import licence Emma Appleby is saying that she must have. If this is true, isn't it just another example of how shambolically this policy is being implemented? Uh, I don't know whether that's true. There is a question of Home Office policy on the controlled drugs. Uh, but all in all, the, it doesn't change the, the fact of the matter, which is that we need to resolve this as soon as possible. Sir Desmond Swain. If the principal issue is that doctors will not prescribe, is there a secondary problem when there is a prescription if being failed failed to be honoured by the bureaucracy? I I have heard that um, accusation being made um, uh, from a couple of the parents. Um, we are, we, I, I, my, I am advised that that is not the case, but I'm very much looking into it because I always think in these circumstances you want to listen to the people who are trying to resolve the issue, uh, and so I'm li- looking into that very point. Stephen Twig. Speaker, I previously raised the case of my constituent, 11-month-old Nathaniel Leahy. Owing to his extremely rare form of epilepsy, he lives in great pain, and his mum told me today, I'm living in fear each day that Nathaniel will not make it to the next day. We were promised in November of last year that this medicine would be available. 
Does he understand the powerful sense of frustration yeah. felt by families like Nathaniel's? And will he address the question of the guidelines so that we can have less stringent <coughs> guidelines to benefit patients? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I entirely understand uh, that sense of frustration. Uh, and I went to meet some of the parents in order to hear very directly from them the pain and the suffering uh, that they, are, they, they and their children, of course, uh, are feeling. I entirely understand that. It's one of the reasons that we're pushing so hard to try to resolve this. Resolving the questions around the guidelines is also very important. Um, the, um, but as he knows, those guidelines are written independently of government ministers. Charlie Elphick. Mr. Speaker, my constituent, Tegan Appleby, uh, suffers horrendously with one of the worst child epilepsy cases in the United Kingdom. Having gone round to her house to see her suffering has been heartrending, and to see how her mother Emma copes with this challenge is just inspiring. I think for many decades we have in this country had legal heroin prescribed as morphine. Why can we not have legal cannabis as well? Is it not high time the NHS got on with changing those guidelines to make sure that medicinal cannabis is available rather than time being wasted arresting Emma at South End Airport, which is quite the wrong thing to see. Mr Speaker, if I may, I think that the Honourable Member, my Honourable Friend uh, for Dover, who, is the, um, who, who, who represents uh, Tegan Appleby and her family uh, and the parents, I think he speaks for the whole House in what he says. I think that he has captured what is the essence of this debate. I am trying to resolve it to his satisfaction, to the family's satisfaction, as soon as possible. There are barriers to that resolution, and I'm determined uh, and um, we're very happy to work with him, with the APPG, and with all others who have constituency cases to try to resolve this significant problem. Dr Lisa Cameron. Many thanks, Mr Speaker. The Secretary of State will be aware of the case of Cole Thompson, aged six, in my constituency, who has battled repeated epileptic seizures every night and has had terrible periods of deterioration. In order to gain the prescription, uh, we really had to battle the system as well as the illness. And I have to say that parents don't have the energy mm. when they're looking after a sick <laughs> child to battle the system. Mm. So can the Secretary of State ensure to streamline this process to make sure that the specialist training is available and meantime to try to put a register of the specialists who can prescribe, make it available to the parents because it's a postcode lottery and it can't go on. Uh, yes, I'd be very happy to do both of those things. Simon Clark. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I uh, commend the Secretary of State for his statement. I, like many others in the South, have had constituents visit me who have made a very powerful personal case about the impact they think cannabis oil could have for their children. Will you join me in praising the work of the campaign group End Our Pain, who have done such a good job in highlighting this and making sure that we in this House are aware of the situation and the benefits it can bring? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I've already paid tribute to the APPG. I think what uh, today's uh, question has demonstrated is the breadth of concern in this House. I think those who are independent of uh, government need to make sure that they listen uh, to this uh, level of concern. Uh, and um, I'm certainly determined to do everything that I can uh, to try to resolve this issue. Paula Sheriff. Mr Speaker, it has always been the case that the Home Secretary could issue a special licence to allow the medical use of cannabis oil. I understand the Health Secretary may be seeing his right honourable friend later this evening, and I wondered if he would ask him if he would consider this course of action. Frustrations for me, um, for the Home Secretary, and of course for the families, is that before the law was changed on the 1st of November, that course of action was open. And for a few dozen cases, the Home Secretary um, made those special licences to allow for the use of medicinal cannabis. We then changed the law, he and I together, to try to make, make sure that medicinal cannabis was available on a mainstream basis. Once it's available on a mainstream basis under the, as a normal drug, it therefore needs clinical sign-off, and the problem is that there are so many cases where that clinical sign-off hasn't been forthcoming. That's, that's a source of immense frustration to me, as I'm, I hope she can uh, imagine, and that's what we're trying to resolve. Um, 
Newt Graham. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Does my right honourable friend agree with me that actually we should be led by evidence and that as our scientific knowledge continues to progress, so should the views and the laws made in this House? So can I ask my right honourable friend to provide more clarity, not just in this instance, but also as new and more radical drugs become available in the near future, how our constituents and how this House can benefit and push through laws more quickly? Um, well, my, my honourable friend makes a very important point, both with respect to this case, which is that um, on the one hand, we need the, to, to, to ensure that medicinal cannabis becomes mainstream in its use, we need to ensure that there is the evidence base there, which for CBD, the, um, the doctors um, essentially think the evidence is a much deeper evidence base than um, for um, THC. But there's a broader point as well, which is that the, the medical profession and this House need to keep up to speed with the evidence as it is developed. But in this case, that means actually going out of our way to develop the evidence and to have these um, uh, clinical trials in which some of the patients who want to see this drug can participate in order to get the evidence base there so that then the vast array of um, specialists can prescribe it. And Diana Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It was clear from the evidence given to the Health and Social Care Select Committee that the government raised public expectations when they uh, rescheduled medical cannabis. And I wonder whether it's now time for the Secretary of State to make sure that there's a public <coughs> awareness campaign with full information about exactly what the government is trying to do. Well, I'll, I'll look at that. Um uh, I'll, I'll look at that idea uh, and we will uh, and, and discuss it and discuss it with the NHS as well. Um, the, um, the, the training program that we're putting in place is intended to raise awareness of the of the evidence and of the change in rules amongst the um, amongst the profession, amongst the amongst doctors and prescribing specialist um, doctors on the on the register, uh, because it's ultimately only with clinical sign off that we're going to be able to uh, allow any drug to be prescribed, um, and that's really where, in the first instance, the training needs to go. Um, but I'll look at her suggestion of doing that more broadly. Uh, Rebecca Powell. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Anyone going through the heart-rending experience of seeing a very sick family member suffer uh, will we'll know that you'll do just anything to help that person, and often reaching the point of desperation. Mm -hmm. So people need to be confident that, if appropriate, they can get hold of cannabis-based medicines and that they're safe. But in this instance, there's a lot riding on the shoulders of our doctors. So would my right honourable friend assure us that the doctors are being given the right guidance to do what's right for the patients, but also that they then won't be blamed if something goes wrong? It is there. Uh, yes, I think that's exactly the right approach and, uh, and, and what we're working towards. Christine Jardine. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. I'd like to thank um, the honourable member for Hemel Hempstead for raising this important issue which affects one of my constituents, Murray Gray, directly. His mother is one of those parents who is now desperate, having been given hope. Would the, the Secretary of State agree with me that we have the evidence from abroad that these medicines can work? We have the willingness of this House, of everyone in here, to make it work. But somehow there is a gap between our willingness and our ability to make it happen. Can he please assure the House that he will speak to the Home Secretary, to the devolved administrations who have NHS um, responsibility as well, and try to get some kind of action together through cooperation to reassure these parents who are now desperate, not just that their children will suffer, but they will not survive? Well, yes, of course, I'm very happy to do that. And, um, I could take this opportunity, Mr. Speaker, also to, uh, to welcome the new Public Health yeah, Minister yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, to her post, um, and, it, 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 and, I'm, and she, no doubt, will have listened to all of the uh, uh, interventions in this uh, question, and uh, she and I will be working on making this happen. I would just add to the list that it isn't just about um, the Home Office and the Department for Health. This is about also the independent uh, medical establishment and uh, ensuring that they have confidence in the evidence that's presented. It, it's not enough for her and I to have confidence as lay professional, as lay um, uh, politicians. It's important that the 
the, the professionals who, who put their signature on the line have confidence in that evidence as well. Can the Secretary of State appreciate the public's concern that at a time when several police forces have openly admitted that they will not take action against those involved in recreational cannabis use, the full weight of the Home Office's border force is deployed to intercept medication for a seriously ill young child? Surely getting medication to a seriously ill young girl should never be a crime. My own friend makes a very, uh, a very important point, and the, the, um, the border force uh, should not be criticised in this case because they were following the rules. And the rules are that if a clinician hasn't signed it off, then it can't uh, come in. And it is incumbent on us on the health side to sort this problem out. But he does make a broader point, which is that this is a completely separate issue to the recreational use of cannabis. I, I do not support a change in the rules on the recreational use of cannabis. This is about the specialist provision of drugs to some children who are the, who are the most vulnerable people in society and the need to ensure that the medical benefits of these drugs can be brought to bear on people who really, really need it. Alex Norris. Mr Speaker, like many colleagues, I've spoken with parents of children with profound challenges that could be ameliorated with medicinal cannabis. They are at their wits' end, and it's no surprise that some in this country resort to desperate measures. You know, I've listened to this for 45 minutes now, and I can't quite tell the answer to this, but does the Secretary of State, are you, is the Secretary of State really saying that we have a clear, universal, safe and compassionate approach to this issue now? And if not, when will we? What I'm saying is that if a patient needs um, the medicinal cannabis and a clinician is, uh, will sign off on that need, uh, then that prescription can happen, and the guidance from the uh, association does not override the individual judgment of that clinician. That can happen, and because it hasn't been happening in many cases which have been brought to light, uh, some privately and some uh, very publicly, um, I'm putting in place a system of second opinions to make sure that we can get that clinical decision right at the same time as developing a stronger evidence base for the future. Tommy Shepherd. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, uh, Reuben Young is an 11-year-old boy in my constituency who suffers from MAE, which is a severe and rare form of epilepsy. Uh, his mother, Emma, is at her wit's end. Conventional medicines don't work, and she has tried to get a prescription for Epidiolex, which is an existing cannabis-derived medicine. She tells me that she is unable to get that because the physicians involved say that the guidelines prevent them from doing so. Now, I don't know why, but for some reason, the change in policy last November is not leading to a change in practice. And I would ask that the Secretary of State speaks with the Home Secretary and has an urgent, and I mean days and weeks, an urgent review into this uh, to see how the existing guidelines can do their job better. Yeah, yeah. Those guidelines are not a matter for the Home Secretary. They are guidelines in the health space, although they, the, the association that writes them does not report directly to me. It is independent. But those guidelines do not prevent a physician who is on the specialist register of the General Medical Council from prescribing. And if anybody has been told that they do, uh, then they do not. It is up to the individual professional judgment of a specialist a clinician on the specialist register uh, to be able to prescribe or not. Mary Glyndon. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Laura Smith, my constituent, is really upset about what happened to Teague and her family at the weekend. Laura travels to Holland every three months to get Bedrocan, a Schedule II drug, for her seriously debilitating illness. Unfortunately, it could be imported, but if that was the case, she would have to bear the licence fee. Can the Minister see if there is anything that can be done for her? Yes. My, my heart goes out to, um, to uh, the Honourable Lady's constituent and her family. Um, and um, the, One of the purposes of having the evidence gathering that we are doing and the calls from the National Institute uh, for uh, trials is to provide the evidence on which the NHS 
uh, can routinely uh, provide these medicines. So we've got at the moment the ability for specialists to be able to prescribe in the interim, but I also want to get that evidence uh, base in place uh, for the longer term. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. One of my constituents, one of many who have been in touch with me on this issue, has multiple sclerosis and has found previously that cannabis uh, helped his symptoms uh, immensely, but he doesn't want to break the law and he can't get pres uh, a prescription. What would the Secretary of State advise him to do? Hey. She'll write to me with the case, then we'll get a second opinion from a clinician who may be able to make that prescription. Jeff Smith. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I, I agree we need to uh, remove the barriers to cl clinicians, we need the evidence. But the problem with randomised controlled trials when it comes to cannabis is the nature of cannabis and the, the, many, the, the very many different types of compounds that interact. And it makes it very difficult to isolate the compounds that work on individuals. In my view, cannabis is a, is a unique treatment and it should really be in, in a licensing and scheduling category of its own to allow different approaches. But can I just, as a first instance, urge the Minister, the Secretary of State, to encourage observational trials so we can allow patients to get access to the medical track uh, cannabis that will work for them. Yeah. We looked at observational trials, but the problem with an observational trial is that it doesn't build the evidence base that a full RCT does, uh, but a full RCT also allows some patients to be able to get access whilst the trial is ongoing. So it is in fact a better, um, a better proposal because it means that you can get some um, patients the treatment now for the trial purposes and that the evidence base can then go to um, providing for the, uh, for the full evidence base for the long term that the, that, uh, the previous question was discussing. Be an ass, but it doesn't have to be applied in an asinine way, as in the case of Emma Appleby. So, can he have words with the Home Secretary and make sure that is not repeated? My constituent, Bailey Williams, uh, is 16 years of age and suffers from the most severe form of epilepsy uh, with multiple seizures every day. And his parents, Rachel and Craig, are absolutely convinced that we need observational trials, that we need more immediate action. And sadly, and I accept it's unintended the change in the law has actually made things worse for these parents, not better. What's the Secretary of State going to do to turn that around quickly? Yes. It, 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 it's a source of deep frustration to me that the change in the law to normalise the use of medicinal cannabis has, exactly as he said, um, made it meant that because a clinical decision is now needed for the prescription, and because those clinical um, decisions in many cases are not forthcoming, means that many parents who think that their child, and uh, entirely understandably think that their child um, would benefit from uh, medicinal cannabis, now find that they can't get a clinician to sign that off. And that is exactly at the root of the problems that we're trying to tackle today. Alan Brown. Mr Speaker, all the Secretary is adamant that the guidelines aren't a problem. It's quite clear the guidelines and associated liability are an issue, and hopefully the review will pick up on this. Four-year-old Logan Chafee in my constituency is the only child in the whole of Europe who has got chromosome 7p duplication syndrome. Now, one of the current rules is there needs to be proven benefit before a clinician can prescribe medicinal cannabis. So can he tell me how he foresees we get to a position where Logan can get medicinal cannabis? Well, she will be able to get it now if a clinician is prepared to sign off on, the, um, on, its, on, the, on it being the right thing for her. And that's why I've put in, if that isn't forthcoming now, that's why I've put in place a system of second op uh, opinions that I've announced today to allow people to be able to get those, uh, uh, those, that, that clinical sign off that they need. Order. It is in the interest of the Honourable Member for Cumbernauld, Kilsyth and Kirkintilloch East that I call his Chief Whip before him. Mr Patrick Grady. Thank you, Mr Speaker. <laughs> Too many families have had expectations raised now um, by the Government's previous announcements and it really is time that they get a move on with all of this. So I will write to him about my young constituent who has Arcardi syndrome um, and how his parents firmly believe that medical cannabis would help her symptoms and seizures. But what steps is he taking to ensure that these kind of rare symptoms um, and rare syndromes are taken into account when they get to the uh, trial stage? They must be taken into account. It comes to the question about the complexity of 
um, cannabis and the many dozens of active um, uh, um, agents in uh, in cannabis, of which CBD and um, THC that we've mostly been discussing today are the main ones. But there are many drugs uh, that have complex interactions like this, and modern science and modern medicine is capable in a uh, controlled environment of understanding and getting to the bottom of which ones have the effect. That's why it's better to do a full RCT with a full um, scientific uh, structure around it rather than an observational trial because it'll get the drugs to some people who need it fast and it'll provide the evidence base. And I hope that that satisfies him that in that space we're doing as much as we can and on timing I want it to happen as quickly as possible. C. Macdonald. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I too have constituents exiled to the Netherlands to secure medicinal cannabis for a severely epileptic child, but also others spending a fortune importing cannabis oil from Canada to help slow progression of a terminal brain tumour. Can the Secretary of State see whether families such as these will soon be able to take part in proper clinical trials as they would be able to elsewhere so that they can have some hope and that we can all benefit from the evidence that will be yeah. gained? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and if he'll write to me with the specific case, then I'll ensure that it's dealt with appropriately. Thank you. Order. Urgent question. Stephen Gethins. Um, to ask the Foreign Secretary if he will make a statement on the situation in Libya. 